here with Anna Menendez, author of The Last War at the Miami Book Fair International. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about literary theory, actually. Hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and specifically the concept of national allegory. One of the reasons that I wanted to set a novel like this in Istanbul is because Istanbul is a city of, of layers, of history, of memory, of things being papered over mm. and forgotten and re-emerging and of all sorts of betrayals, you know, the imperial capital. And all of those things inform the main theme of the book, which is just that, uh, the burial of, of memory, the uh, persistence of history, the cruelty, immense cruelty that we uh, inflict on one another. And of course, an imperial capital is full of memory of cruelty. So much of the action of the, of the book takes place in this old imperial capital. But much of the engine, well, all of the engine of the plot really has to do with another imperial capital. <laughs> and how do you relate the fate of the U.S. as it's presented in the book to the history of Istanbul? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a nice um, uh, sort of rhyming device, I guess, uh, because of we know all empires eventually fail and they fail through hubris, and um, there is a lot of that. Uh, the, the other theme in the book is, is the imperial wars. I mean, those are going in the, uh, on in the background of this. And um, it, it, they are two mighty empires uh, at different stages of their decline, <laughs> we should say. <laughs> and uh, that also is important uh, to uh, the book because um, it, in, in, in terms of what we come to history with and what we take away from history and how we deal with things like power and corruption and cruelty and violence. Um, those are sort of rhyming with this old capital. The idea of national allegory is that in certain works of fiction there'll be a couple, a romance, that reflects the founding of the nation mm -hmm. or an important transition in the nation. Interesting. And because you're looking at an imperial level, mm -hmm. um, I'm tempted to think about the ways in which the love story reflects, and you know, everybody knows that there's personal elements to that love story, mm -hmm. but I'm also interested in the way in which the personal transmits the historical. Yeah, interesting. I like that very much. Uh, because in a lot of ways, their relationship is born uh, in the youth of exploration and adventure. And that's how all countries are founded. I mean, you know, we're going to go out and see this world and conquer it and make it ours. And uh, their relationship is very much that at the beginning. They're these two young people, and they, they go and conquer the world, and then the world conquers them. When we talk about history uh, and we talk about nations, very often you see that the macro repeated in the micro and mm. vice versa. And I've said this many times about Cuba, where... Uh, the systems, the political systems that we've had to endure of tyranny and, uh, and suppression and uh, intolerance are the same themes that you see on the micro level uh, in how we deal with each other, in how we deal even within our own families sometimes. That's one of the very dangerous things about uh, war, is that they uh, give us a narrative of violence. The human being is a copying animal. We imitate. And it's, it's uh, inevitable that we're going to repeat these grand narratives that our leaders are writing for us. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the couple, you alluded to earlier in the conversation about the triangle. That in the end turns out not to be necessarily the triangle one might expect. Um, but I, but I, I couldn't help thinking about the name Alexandra and Alexandria and sort of the the resurgence of... Another big imperialist. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this sort of constant reminder, almost this return of the repressed that you can't yeah. get away from. Yeah, and that you try to. And, uh, and that nations try to. You know, nations try to bury history also. Wow. And they, they try to bury misdeeds. And you cannot. It comes back one way or the other, sometimes uh, warped. And, uh, and in the form of stories, but still it comes back. Uh, it's always there. You have this sort of motif, which is that the warrior will triumph over the poet. Yeah. 
throughout the, the book, and I feel that you use, you quote directly more poetry than I usually see in novels. Yeah. And Dover Beach has always been, especially those those lines about you know love, let us be true to one another, yes. has always been a very important poem to me. Yeah. Um, and you sort of flip that around at the end, or at least sort of mm -hmm. shift who is seen as the warrior and who's seen as the yes. poet. Um, why set up that opposition as a frame for the work? Hmm. Well, um, part of it is because uh, this particular book is about uh, the resurgence and the persistence of violence, uh, not just at the national level, but at the very personal level, mm. and the persistence of those things over beauty. And it's, it's a tough thing to um, write about, and it's not anything that I would want people to think is a philosophy that I have, or a philosophy even worth having for that matter. But it is a truism that it is much easier to destroy than it is to create. And, and I think that's what um, Brando is talking about when he says the warrior will always triumph over the poet. I, it's not really a philosophy that I um, adhere to myself, I think, because I think it's important um, to to defend poetry and not poetry as a profession, but poetry as an idea, which is the beautiful and the sublime, and those things need to be defended. We cannot be alive uh, and hopeful and think that poetry will not triumph. You clearly spend a lot of time putting together your prose, that there's a certain lyricism and there's an imagism, mm. um, the way that you close your chapters, um, I would say is, is poetic. No, thank you. Why is that something that you pay attention to? I don't know. I think just for the joy of it. Um, my uncle's a poet, and I grew up with poetry, mm. and uh, that really was my first introduction to the language was poetry. I mean, he gave me two Carl Sandburg books when I was in kindergarten. So <laughs> to me, it's, it's not anything uh, fancy or elitist poetry is the stuff of life and it's important for me to feel an aesthetic pleasure when I'm writing and rereading my own things because I think there is something to be said for the old-fashioned concept of beauty and art uh, and visual art and performing arts what draws human beings to to art is is the sublime. We don't want to read about people exactly like ourselves, no matter what people say. You know, we, we want to read about, as Aristotle said, people that are better than us or worse than us, uh, but in somehow transcendent of us. These are old-fashioned ideas about art, I know, but I think that uh, from it animates what I do, uh, and I know that if I'm, uh, when I get it right, which is not often, but when I do get it right, or when I feel that I've gotten it right, and I read it back to myself, I get pleasure from it, and that's ultimately why I do what I do.